Recently, two letters seem to appear almost daily in news headlines. The letter A and the letter I. Discussions abound of how the technology will affect day-to-day -day life with groups on both sides of the debate, either advocating its benefits or warning us of its perils. It can be easy to feel that this is a new argument, but the battle between technology and those whom it affects goes back generations. Today, we explore the story of one man who felt so threatened by machinery that he decided he'd rather see his town burn. In 1802, John Carter was born here in Lambourne, a small rural village in southeast England. He was the son of John Carter Sr. and Elizabeth Harper. They remained in Lambourne, and when John was old enough, he found work as a farm labourer. By 1831, the now 29-year-old was married to a woman named Elizabeth Ball, with the pair having a young child, a son named William. Life was not easy for the young family, and while the birth of their second child the following year would have no doubt been a joyous occasion, having another mouth to feed only added to their problems. The Carters weren't the only ones struggling to make ends meet during these times. Many farm workers were finding it difficult, to the point where some decided to do something about it. During the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, one of the main jobs that farm labourers were taking on in the autumn and winter months was threshing, the menial task of separating the grains from the crops. With the number of jobs decreasing, low wages and no real hope for the situation to improve, the last straw for these agricultural workers was the mechanization of labor. This came in the form of a new enemy, threshing machines, or more specifically, the farmers who owned them. The swing riots were an uprising that started in the year 1830. The name being derived from Captain Swing, a fictitious character who sent threatening letters to farmers, magistrates, members of the clergy, and other people in positions of power. One such letter was published in the London Gazette in 1811. It read, quote, Blood and vengeance against your life and your property for taking away our labor with your threshing machine. Seven of us near your dwelling house have agreed that if you do not refrain from your threshing machine, we will thresh your rick with fire and bathe your body in blood. How will the people of Reading gaze to see early court all in a blaze? Unquote. While these machines had been around for some time, their growing use by farmers and the fact that 1829 had seen a particularly bad harvest and harsh winter only served to amplify their impact on workers' employment and incomes. Such was the case for John Carter. Other factors to spark the uprising were tithes, a rule that meant 10% of farmers' produce had to be given to support the Anglican Church, Authorities who were in charge of enforcing the country's poor laws, who workers saw as abusing their powers, and farmers who they believed to be rich and only introducing agricultural machinery to increase their wealth. The riots, which first started on a farm in East Kent, spread rapidly and ended up affecting many local communities. These were obviously not seen with positive eyes by farmers or even by some of the workers who could risk losing the few jobs that existed due to being suspected of being rioters themselves. The riots quickly grew violent with those involved smashing threshing machines and threatening farmers who used them. A detailed recollection of one such event is available in Norman Fox's book, Berkshire to Botany Bay. Quote, the Hungerford men made their way to Denford, where they met with their Kentbury comrades. From there, the combined body, possibly around 500 men, 
marched on Mr. Haters at Denford Farm, from which, having smashed all the machinery they could find, they advanced on Hungerford." Unquote. It appears that during one of these such attacks, a vicar, Mr. Johnson, the vicar of Enborn, had suggested that if the rioters would be given £10, they ought to be thankful and go away quietly. When the noble lord eventually decided to give the money, the mob gave three cheers and went away. After this event, the congregation of rioters continued walking, eventually arriving at the farm of William Webb of Marsh Benham. It was around 4 p.m. when they arrived at the farm, and what they discovered there angered them even more. Webb's employees were using a threshing machine. One of the workers stated that he saw multiple people attacking and striking the machine with a sledgehammer. Among them was John Carter. Between 1830 and 1831, a large number of protesters were tried and some of them were even sentenced to death. As a result of this, workers and farmers had very tense relations over the following years. Two years after these events, in 1832, John Carter's daughter, Hannah, was born. This normally joyous occasion was derailed with the increased pressures of this cost of living, low wages, and the further rise of mechanization. And with new riots taking place, a decision was made that would derail John Carter's life entirely. On the calm, damp, and misty evening of the 19th of November, 1832, an inn in the town of Lambourne belonging to Henry and James Spicer, along with the adjoining stable, outhouse, coach house and malt house, was set ablaze by an unknown attacker. People tried in vain to extinguish the fire as it spread to nearby buildings. John himself was among those who rushed to fight the blaze, and he collected a cash reward for doing so. Despite this seemingly selfless act, it would later be alleged that he, along with three other men named as Thomas Winkworth, Henry Ryder, and Robert Chivers, were the ones to set the fire. One of the three accomplices, Robert Chivers, a labourer who worked with Carter on the day of the fires, heard him saying that he did not think there would be any good times at Lambourne till there had been a good fire. Already a pretty damning statement. Chivers also heard Carter specifically mention the Red Lion Inn. John allegedly detailed a plan he had to get matches and start a fire with the help of his friend who later refused to participate. Many people came forward saying they had seen Carter behaving suspiciously on the evening of the blaze, even saying they saw him placing something in the thatch of the inn just before the fire started. Soon enough, the suspected arsonist was taken into police custody as the main suspect for the attack. A man named William May was also in the cells at the same time as Carter and heard him say that he did light the matches that started the fire and did not mind being transported overseas for the crime as long as he was not hanged. Another named accomplice, Henry Ryder, acknowledged that he was present during a conversation about fires between Carter and Thomas Winkworth. It's claimed that Winkworth promised the man a pot of beer as a reward for his brave act. With mounting evidence against him, along with many eyewitness accounts all pointing to the father of two, John Carter was swiftly found guilty, while all those believed to have been his accomplices were eventually acquitted. Carter had hoped for a sentence of transportation, which was often a punishment given to protesters and people found guilty of theft. He even jokingly mentioned that he was looking forward to starting a new life overseas. However, a new life was not what John Carter would be given. The judge wanted to send a harsh message to anyone considering following in the footsteps of the arsonist. 
And that message would come in the form of John Carter's public execution. Newspaper reports of the time stated that the condemned showed no feelings of despair, but he could not avoid shedding tears. Almost four months after his trial, the arsonist was hanged at Reading Jail in Berkshire on March the 16th, 1833. It is said that over 5,000 people witnessed the execution. His gravestone still stands in the churchyard of St. Michael and All Angels in the historic English village of Lambourne. If the execution was not warning enough, the stone reads, Here lies the body of John Carter of this parish, labourer who in defiance of the laws of God and man, willfully and maliciously set fire in two places to this town of Lambourne on the 19th day of November 1832 and was executed at Reading in the 30th year of his age on the 16th day of March 1833, having desired that his body might be interred here as a warning to his companions and others who may hereafter read this memorial to his untimely end. The wages of sin is death. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, and so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Right then, thank you for watching. Take care, and I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, well, I never.